Hi, welcome to chapter four, part two. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and um, present from my Canva slides. I know they have Canva throughout, but bear with me. So this chapter, part two, we're talking about surveillance, horizontal and vertical surveillance, the two types. Horizontal is when people have roughly the same amounts of power. So um, when we are looking at people like our friends and what they're doing online, um, you know, it's a way of watching them. And we could call it social surveillance. This is what Professor Alice Marwick calls it. Um, when we're just doing, you know, normal, it's a normal part of everyday life online um, is looking at what other people are doing. And, you know, companies could look at each other, like look at each other's websites. That would be horizontal because they have the same amount of power. Um, vertical is asymmetrical when there's an uneven amount of power. So um, like a company is tracking its users, the government is following its citizens. When we are monitoring like um, Facebook or Instagram, Meta um, is tracking us and monitoring what we're doing, that's vertical surveillance. So we usually think of vertical surveillance in the negative sense, but Chaco likes to be balanced and try to look at the positives as well um, to any kind of new technology or um, especially to our techno-social lives. So the negatives would be that um, we could be open to manipulation. When I, I recommend the documentary, well, it's actually kind of half documentary, half fictional um, betrayal of, um, or drama of, um, called The Social Dilemma. And I, I would also recommend faith, The Facebook Dilemma. Both of those, Social Dilemma and Facebook Dilemma, um, are great for to look at, you know, to kind of understand all of these issues. But some of the negatives is that we could be very open to ma manipulation. If someone has a lot of data about us, they know us very well, then they know how to push our buttons. They know what what will likely get our attention, what, um, how to influence us. There have been experiments about just even really simple little messages that Facebook has um, put in people's feeds versus other feeds where they didn't put that message and, and it had a pretty extreme um, outcome on people's behavior. So we could be open to manipulation just because someone, is, the technology companies or the government is knows so much about us and is tracking us and knows what we're, how we're likely to respond to things. We could be manipulated by advertising. I'm actually kind of scared um, right now because there's so many more online gambling sites and I'm starting to see those ads in my, um, it was actually like in my podcasts or um, things that I was listening to. But I mean, that's really scary because they can track like your mood and they can track what, when you might be most vulnerable to getting that kind of ad. Um, and when, you know, so you could, you know, I, we'll see what happens with online gambling, but it's a lot more accessible now and legal most places. Um, so there's just a lot more temptation. We can also be manipulated in terms of propaganda. So um, we might, and this has been documented, especially in the 2020 um, presidential election, you know, we are just seeing more and more content that is like content you've already seen. So we can get down rabbit holes, or what they call them, or just um, have confirmation bias or echo chambers. or referring to when we see only things that confirm our worldview, or we like we start to see things in the news that we expect to see that confirm what, how we see the world. And we might not be seeing um, reality, but just a kind of a, a part of it. And so we could be manipulated and open to propaganda. Um, also, like our behavior could be punished. So we could um, be tracked by the government by if we attend a protest or we sign petitions or we follow certain pages or um, activists. Life insurance companies also use social media to assess risk of um, and costs and set rates that we might not even realize are being are happening. Um, health insurance companies could as well. So it's, you know, I think you can pretty quickly, quickly get into um, some really dark uses of um, big data. 
some of the positives, like, again, Chico likes to have positives that it could, um, we could see useful information. You know, we might um, get suggested content and that would, could be provided to us. We could be, um, she even mentions like we, the people you know, tabs that we see like on social media or suggested, you know, if you like this page, you, you would like this one. Some of that content is really useful. Of course it is. That's why we stay on those sites so long, but um, we could find information that we, that we would like to and find people that we might have things in common with. Um, in terms of like emergencies, you know, because we're being tracked and our location, we can be sent like Amber Alerts or um, like we were sent a few months ago, we were at the beach and um, I got an alert, like, please disperse immediately from the police. So it turns out it was like in Huntington Beach, there were some protests and counter protests and some like kind of civil unrest. And so they were, the police were using people's phones and location just to clear and kind of warn you of any, um, we could get that kind of warning if for like mass shooting or other dangerous situations. Um, and we could even track and find people that were missing, people who have cognitive, um, uh, different cognitive abilities, um, people with dementia or Alzheimer's, maybe we could find them. Surveillance, I wanted to note, can be difficult or maybe probably impossible to escape. Several sociologists, there was one example of a sociologist who was expecting a child, she was pregnant, and she tried to keep it from um, social media and try to figure out like, could she keep this news of her pregnancy and the birth a secret from um, all like the tech companies? So she, of course, she had to like constantly monitor her social media that no one was posting anything about it. And she didn't have pictures showing her pregnancy that she would turn off like tracking on her phone when she would go to doctors. Um, she would have, like, she did, of course didn't have to, a registry for like Amazon or Target, and she had to buy things through gift cards. So she started like buying gift cards with cash or um, so people, so nobody could track like what kinds of things she was buying online. Um, but then like this became really difficult and was kind of like a full-time job just trying to hide this. Um, and other people have tried to hide, like not to have a Google account and try to like do things in life without a Google account is extremely difficult. There are web pages you can't go to. It's very difficult to not have Gmail, um, you know, logging into things. It's like, it, you're going really against the stream um, or against the tide if you try to evade surveillance. Now, of course, there are times when you could do certain things like um, use Signal or um, Viber or, you know, other messaging services that are not that like have end-to-end -end encryption. And, um, but again, it's like you're, it's taking a lot of time for you to do that, to evade surveillance. Oh, uh, let's see, I feel like we already covered that, yeah. Okay, horizontal surveillance. So um, horizontal surveillance is more the peer-to-peer. -peer. And some of the positives is that we can deepen our knowledge of other people. I mean, of course we love to, like you make a new friend, or start a new relationship and you go back and look at their social media or look at their profile, look at their pictures, get to know them better so we can um, deepen our friendships. We also share norms and values through social approval, which is similar to gossip. We've always done this, you know, looked at um, what our neighbors are doing or looking at what other people are doing and commenting on it, gossiping about their behavior. And when we do that, we're kind of working through our own feelings about is this behavior possible? We might see, oh, like I have a friend that, um, you know, is dating and I can see what she's doing and, and she, um, you know, I can see, oh, maybe um, you get some idea about what's possible in your life or um, what, you know, somebody did something and you could see, well, maybe that wasn't a good choice or that was a good idea. So we kind of learn about the world through looking at other people. And that's, We've always done that. Um, and we set our norms and like process our feelings and 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 kind of all those things with reference groups. And um, so, but some of the negatives, and Chico would argue that anytime people are interacting, 
there are negative behaviors. Um, people gossip in malicious ways. We have biases and prejudices against certain groups. The dominant group in society will, might praise them more and get they might have more social approval. Um, there is bullying, there's exclusion, there are in-group, out-groups, all of these things. But she would say they're not um, endemic to social media. This happens whenever people get together. There could be um, more of some of the negative behaviors because people are not, don't have to see the reaction of other people that they're speaking badly about or that they're harassing. Um, and then I would add that technology companies make money from our relationships interactions. So even the horizontal surveillance, um, you know, the, someone's making money off of, of our friendship maintenance online. I wanted to have just a little word about stalking because we joke about like cyber stalking and um, as when we look deeply into someone's online social media. So like we joke, oh, I was stalking you on, you know, on Instagram and I saw that like, you know, all these things. But we, we say it more of a, in a joking way because I think the norms about how much we should follow someone or how in depth we can look at someone's activity online is, is still evolving. But um, I want to make sure that we are clear that stalking that, that that is not stalking. So looking through someone's social media account and looking at like all their past posts and things, that's not necessarily stalking. That's public information, or at least they, they've put this profile together. They've put those pictures up. They want people to look at it to get to know them. So that's not really stalking, even though we say that. Stalking is a type of harassment when someone is being followed in order to intimidate, threaten, or assert control over them. So with stalking, like the harassment stalking, there is a threat implied, like I can get to you, I know where you are, I'm watching you, is a threat. And that's different than what we're doing um, with the horizontal surveillance, which is just a normal part of our techno-social world. Privacy and obscurity is a section of chapter four, and she uses the term digital footprint. So, you know, just she wants you to, um, the readers to be aware that we are not, what there's really no such thing as privacy online, and that we should consider that anything we post or put online um, could be accessed by someone else, and that it might never really go away. So it's hard to, we cannot be guaranteed privacy or obscurity, like things could be retrieved well into the future. And related to that is context collapse, um, that just in everyday life, we, we act according to context. Like some behavior is acceptable in one context and not in another. So, you know, I would, when I'm talking to my friends, I use slang, I might cuss, um, but where, when I'm with my parents or, you know, my children, I would be on better behavior and watch my language more. So that's normal for us to, read, to, to have different types of interactions and behaviors in different contexts. But online, we kind of make these contexts like artificially, but they could easily collapse in something that we share in one context that would be appropriate, wouldn't be appropriate in another, and that can easily happen with digital spaces. And the last concept or section kind of that I wanna talk about in chapter four is citizen journalism. So um, citizen journalism refers to when people can self publish and they can act like journalists online by sharing what's happening in their lives or in their communities without the traditional gatekeepers of media that we've had in the past. So um, without having like trained journalists who study ethics and study to be journalists. We don't have editors that are fact-checking things, um, publishers who are making decisions about what is appropriate and what is um, safe and kind of re um, ethical to publish and how many sources you need and fact-checking and so on. Um, what is like in the public interest all of those safeguards that we have in traditional journalism are not there with citizen journalism. Of course, we can think of positives to that because people who were kept out of power structures and were not listened to and were not being paid attention to in 
in the mainstream or um, in traditional journalists, then they were able to tell their stories. So we can see a lot of positive. However, there are also there's also a lot of um, room for people to share propaganda, to share um, stories that just like clickbait and a whole host of other problems that um, like misinformation and propaganda. So how can you tell when information on social media are credible or fake? And what are your personal rules about deciding whether to share information and become a citizen journalist, even when you're just sharing something like an, a newspaper article or some information your friend shared or um, you know, boosting someone else's content. So that's something that I will have you think about and try to really be specific and um, take that responsibility seriously.